Chuck uh, serves on the National Council for Community and Behavioral Health Care and directs the public policy, government affairs, and practice improvement initiatives designed to assist almost 2,000 members of the association, and these are separate organizations across the country, in providing hope and healing to over 8 million persons with mental illness and addiction disorders around the country. The National Council is the unifying voice of America's behavioral health organizations and advocates for public policies and mental and behavioral health that ensure that people who are ill can access comprehensive health care services. Before joining the National Council, Mr. Ngoglia provided pro policy and program design guidance to the Center for Mental Health Services at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Ngoglia currently teaches courses in mental health policy at George Washington University and travels around the country educating audience such, audiences such as ours regarding recent policy developments particularly connected to the Affordable Care Act and its impact on mental health care and delivery. Mr. Ngoglia received a master's degree of social work from the Catholic uh, University of America. So we're extremely grateful to have him here. And before we introduce him to the podium, I want to just mention one thing, and that is after each presentation, we're leaving it up to the uh, guest as to, as to how much time there might be for a Q&A. And if there is time for a Q&A afterward, we're going to have uh, some of our interns uh, around the theater with microphones. So if you have questions, just raise your hand. And we'd appreciate it if you could just limit yourself to one question, please, and just be respectful of both our guests and each other as audience members. So without further ado, welcome Chuck and Golia. Hi, good morning. So you guys have a high tolerance of pain. You came back uh, to hear me again, so uh, thank you for that. Um, Eric mentioned I work for the National Council for Community Behavioral Health Care, and we're a membership association of about 2,000 organizations, and we serve kind of as an advocacy and education um, organization supporting the work that they do around the country. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the National Council and our views around collaborative care um, and the integration of uh, primary care and behavioral health. And, you know, we had a discussion last night about the Affordable Care Act and kind of this idea that's embedded in the Affordable Care Act that integration is a good idea. Um, and that's been something that the National Council has been talking about uh, well before the Affordable Care Act came around. And, and today I'm going to try to do, so yesterday was a 30,000 foot view of the Affordable Care Act and kind of what's happening in the broader health care system. Today I'm going to try to give a broad overview of the ideas of integrated care, why it's important, how it operates, what are some of the conceptual frameworks uh, and models that we should be uh, thinking about. And I think that my presentation then will be augmented very well by the other speakers who are going to talk about some of the local experience here in Wisconsin. So I'm going to try to do some of the, the table setting and then they will uh, fill in some of those goals. Uh, but you know, I think the important thing that we'll hear both from them and what we observe traveling around the country um, is that integration is happening, that there is local collaboration occurring around um, uh, trying to provide better care to people, uh, trying to make that care seamless, uh, and this idea of one-stop shopping. I was talking to somebody last night um, and you know about um, kind of what's going to be the expectation in the future. And don't most of us, we like going to the shopping mall, right? Because we go to the shopping mall and there are lots of different stores that we can hit all at once. We park once, we go in, we can do a lot of different things. Uh, I think there's a growing expectation in healthcare too that people like being able to go to one place and get multiple things done at the same time, that they don't want to have uh, multiple appointments, m multiple places that they have to go. Um, so I think that is uh, certainly um, also kind of consumer preference also pushing a, a lot of this. All right, so we're going to talk about what are, from our organization's perspectives, what are we thinking about uh, related to this? But again, I think a lot of these ideas then are embedded in emerging policy themes, whether they be uh, medical homes or other things. Uh, the idea, though, that we also have a responsibility. If you think about 
the conceptual framework of accountable care organizations and medical homes, what they say is that there's one entity that's responsible for managing the total health care experience of a defined population. Uh, that this is um, not going to be I do this and you do that. It's really how do we work together to meet the total needs of individuals. Um, and I think in behavioral health care, we've done a lot of you know we've done a lot of work over the last few years um, refining our interventions becoming clear about this idea of recovery, that we want people to have a life in the community, that they deserve that, um, that the goal of our treatment is to inc increase functioning and to give people hope. Um, but what's the, what's the good of having hope and recovery if you're dead at the age of 53? You know, that we've done a very bad job of paying attention to the total health care needs of individuals. And what we're really seeing then is there's new expectations for us as a field. And I know sometimes people say, not another expectation. Don't we have enough expectations? Uh, but I think we also have a moral duty to make sure that the people that we're responsible for, who see us as their source of care, um, have access to baseline primary care screening um, and uh, at least referral to primary care. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and it's also incumbent upon us because, some, as was discussed last night, some of our interventions like medications have impact on individuals uh, that you know uh, certain and uh, second generation antipsychotics cause rapid weight gain uh, which then brings with it cardiovascular disease and diabetes and this idea of these uh, kind of new i kind of think of this as new expectations um, is certainly rooted um, in programs. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, has a grant program called Primary Care Behavioral Health Integration. And it's a grant program avail that gives money to behavioral health organizations for them to co-locate primary care services on site. And um, I'm told that maybe even as early as next week, SAMHSA will be releasing another RFA to award more grants. So those of you who are here who are kind of energized and thinking about this idea about how do we do a better job of providing primary care to people that we serve, I think want to be on the lookout uh, for that RFA. So there are currently 64 organizations around the country who are working on this. I think the, the RFA will fund up to 22 new grants. Um, we, as we discussed last night, also this idea of health homes that are emerging in Medicaid that your state also is looking at is another way. So these um, new expectations are actually then being played out in, uh, in, with funding and around the country. All right, so you know, our hope then is that folks that we serve who traditionally are poor, uninsured, um, frequently called safety net populations, uh, we also have hope that they would have access to all of the care that they need in their community. Um, and this is not about us replicating what other people do, right? It's not about us um, building a primary care practice necessarily, but how do we collaborate with existing resources? And I think what's been interesting over the last uh, four or five years and what we've been saying to our members is those of us who are in the mental health and substance use community, we're really good at talking to each other, right? We get together all the time and we complain and we strategize and we come up with ideas, uh, but frequently we don't know uh, uh, the hospital administrator in our community. We don't, we don't have a relationship with the federally qualified health center. Um, that this is also about establishing new kinds of uh, relationships and. I don't know what the experience here is in Wisconsin, so I won't comment on it, but sometimes the conversation goes like this. Hi, I'm from the Community Mental Health Center. We hear you have a lot of money. Can you give us some? Um, and you know that's usually not a good way to start the conversation, right? Because then the FQHC or the hospital are kind of like, you know, who are you? What, what do you want? You know? Um, and I think a good, another way to think about it, and we're going to talk more about this, is what do we have to offer other parts of healthcare? And I think we've not thought about that strategically, right? It's all been about what can we get to help us. And I think part of the opportunity we have, and we're going to talk about some of this prevalence, is um, 
you know, primary care emergency rooms, they're drowning in people with mental illness and substance use disorders. They're disrupting the flow of their practice, they're costly, um, and we know something about serving that population. I think we also have opportunities here. So it's about, you know, trying to figure out what do I have I have to actually have some skills um, and some expertise that will help you. I think that's a much better way to start that conversation than, hey, give me some of your money. All right. And then that then gets into, you know, kind of what, what do we know about the prevalence of these disorders? And there have been several studies that have come out in the last few years. I think, um, you know, kind of historically we've thought that these disorders are not that prevalent because we've kind of based it on, well, what is our experience in the private sector? And then that's influenced funding. It's also influenced expectations for how many people you're going to serve. Uh, but new research is emerging suggesting that there are very high rates of mental health and substance use disorder amongst uh, populations with chronic health conditions. So this is a report called Faces of Medicaid 3, which basically says that 49% of Medicaid beneficiaries with disabilities have a psychiatric illness, uh, that there's a lot of comorbid um, mental health and substance use disorders in this population who have chronic health conditions. And guess what else about this population? they tend to be very expensive. They the, tend to be the most expensive people in Medicaid. So again, as we think about opportunity, uh, what could we do to better manage that mental health and substance use and that is actually a benefit uh, to state and county government? Now, sometimes in our field, we like to beat ourselves up, right? That we're, everything that we do is wrong, everything that other people do is right. And uh, again, I think we need to recognize that we do have expertise and there are things that we can offer uh, the rest of healthcare. Uh, I've been surprised, you know, there's this discussion about how so much of mental health medication is prescribed by primary care docs. Um, I've had occasion recently, and I'm sure others will have this, where I've been lecturing residents, medical school residents, and they're freaked out about, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, um, prescribing uh, mental health medications. They don't feel competent, you know, that they want more access to psychiatric care. It's not like these folks are doing it because uh, it's something that they enjoy. It's, but they, you know, people show up in their practice, they've got to do something for them, uh, and it's, you know, frequently the easiest thing to do is to, to whip out the prescri prescription pad. Um, but we know that uh, frequently writing a prescription is not enough, uh, that these uh, folks don't have uh, necessarily the experience, they don't practice according to uh, uh, evidence-based guidelines, um, and that they um, don't necessarily um, have what they need in order to, um, to succeed with this population. Now, I use depression in this example only because depression is so prevalent. It's also, um, you could substitute anxiety, you could substitute uh, substance use disorders, uh, though those are also things that are very commonly seen in primary care. So we know that on the primary care side, there's a need then for collaboration, that they um, don't necessarily have the tools that they need, that they actually want to have a relationship with specialty care. Um, and, you know, uh, what you'll also hear from primary care, though, is our system is a black box. If they make a referral to the mental health or substance use system, um, what do they get back, usually? Nothing. If they make a referral to any other kind of specialist, they get a summary of what the diagnosis was, what the recommended course of treatment is, what the next steps are uh, for that care, how they might be able to coordinate. Uh, but in our system, uh, we're not used to doing that kind of stuff. We don't send any kind of um, uh, summary back to primary care. Um, also, because we've been so separate from the rest of primary care, they don't know, necessarily know who we are, right? It's not like uh, uh, they know how to get a hold of us. Um, we're not their golfing buddies. Uh, we're not the people they went to medical school with. Uh, and, you know, the relationships are important, right? Those are, who are the people that they know. I think the other problem that we've got to wrestle with as a system, and I don't know how it plays out here, uh, but primary care is not so interested in making a referral when the first available appointment is six months from now. 
uh, or we can get you in for an assessment in three weeks, and after that assessment, which might take two or three sessions, we can get you in to see a therapist, and after about six more weeks of that, we'll get you in to see a psychiatrist. Um, that also seems a little daunting but to primary care, as well as to the people who are having that experience. Um, so there's obviously a, a need on primary care side. They want uh, to make referral, um, but then also, you know, what's the kind of rationale for our vision that people have easy access? Uh, and we've talked about this, right, that we know that our population has particular um, needs. Um, the, the figure that's most often cited is that people with serious mental illness die at the average age of 53. Um, there's been some newer research done by Ben Druss uh, from Emory University, which actually, um, this study did not control for poverty. And uh, Ben Drus did a, a new study recently where he controlled for socioeconomic status. And um, because part of the reality, right, is that people with mental illness tend, especially if you have serious mental illness, you tend to be poor. You tend to be on disability. And just by virtue of that, your options are a lot more limited. Uh, so in Drus's new study, he controlled for socioeconomic status. Uh, but even then, uh, he showed an eight year differential in premature death for people with serious mental illness. So it's not as bad as 25 years, but it's still not what we would want for ourselves or for anybody that we love, is it? Um, so we know that we also have a responsibility. Um, and you know, if we look at, uh, from that NASHBID study, what are the causes of this premature death? Uh, a lot of them are modifiable. There are things that can be changed. Things like smoking, alcohol consumption, uh, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, et cetera. That these are modifiable risk behaviors. And what are we in the business of doing? Helping people change their behavior, right? Isn't that what part of what our uh, role is um, as uh, behavioral health care? So I think we have, but we've not necessarily paid attention to this as a system, right? Where, you know, we've had. Um, some of our consultants out working with uh, organizations and suggesting that they ask people, how many Cokes do you drink a day? How many packs of cigarettes? How many cigarettes do you smoke? What do you eat? And we've had CEOs stand up and say, that's not our job. Um, folks, I don't think we can say that's not our job. You know, when we have people who are dying at this rate, we've got to take some responsibility. Um, but also then, if we're successful with this population, these are also then skills that we can bring to the rest of healthcare, which is the other way I, I want us to keep thinking about this. What opportunities do we have as a field to support other parts of healthcare? Now, what makes some of this complicated is even in a good system, um, people with mental illness get differential care. And Dr. Uh, Brown last night in his study talked about the fact that the VA has uh, one of the best systems uh, in the country. Uh, and they've been operating integrated care for a number of years. Uh, and actually, I think this is, comes from a study that Ben Druss did of people with serious mental illness who also have diabetes. Uh, I know it must be easy to read on your handout. Uh, but basically what it shows is that uh, people who have serious mental illness are treated in the VA system who also have diabetes, that their care it does not um, meet um, evidence-based standards, that their care is different from other people in the VA system who have diabetes, that there is something about that co-occurring co uh, chronic uh, mental health condition uh, that prevent that um, for some reason they're not getting um, the same amount of, uh, of, of care, um, uh, whether that be things like, um, oh, I can't even read my, it's so small. Did they have eye exams, feet tests, was their uh, blood sugar under control, that there's differential care um, for people with serious mental illness. So the question then becomes, uh, we can't, and it's not just a question then of that the primary care system is perfect and we're bad, that we're bad and they're perfect, that we each have something to teach each other, and that there's something about these illnesses uh, that makes care complicated. So as we thought about this um, as, a, as an organization about 10 years ago, we came up with this idea of thinking about this population in four quadrants. Now this is a model that's been used in other parts uh, of our system. Uh, you may have seen it. This was also used about conceptualizing the treatment of co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders, originally developed in New York State. 
um, in, I think actually in the early 90s. Uh, but we took this model then to think about how do we think about uh, populations who have both mental illness and substance use disorder as well as health conditions. Um, how do we think about uh, uh, who, who should treat them, where they should be treated, um, and what's the relationship between primary care and behavioral health? Because I think sometimes uh, when this idea of integration is talked about, uh, people jump to the conclusion, well, we don't need a mental health and substance use system. Primary care will do everything, right? Um, that uh, uh, will just do everything there. But I think some of the other results suggest that that's not necessarily going to work for populations with more serious disorders, uh, that they're going to need um, specialty care. And, you know, the, the reality also, right, is that uh, there's always a boundary between primary care and specialty care, no matter what the specialty is. Primary care can do baseline services, but when people need more intensive interventions, that's why we have a specialty system. Now, what's important though, to think about, this is not like a um, diagnosis or level of care tool that you should use to you know, kind of uh, decide where people go. This is a, a systems planning tool. It's a way to conceptualize relationships. It's not meant to be you know, kind of uh, uh, prescriptive. Um, and basically what we have here is we think about people, what is the um, level of their physical health condition? Do they have um, mild, uh, no or mild uh, prime, uh, physical health problems along this bottom axis? And then uh, up and down is behavioral health conditions. So how severe are those conditions? Um, so we want to think then about, um, so people who don't have very severe physical health conditions and who have mild to moderate mental illness or substance use um, as one group of people, and then further along, uh, people who have more uh, serious or chronic health conditions as well as more serious and chronic uh, behavioral health conditions, thinking about them uh, differently. Now, always have to have the caveats, right? Um, when we say behavioral health conditions, we mean both mental health and substance use. Um, that um, the, the recommendation is, and then we think about then, uh, depending on this level of severity, it also then talks about not only where they should be treated, but how. And we're going to get more into that uh, because we also have a lot of evidence about what are effective ways. Uh, to serve this population. So it's not, it's not simply, will they get served in primary care and we leave them to their own devices, but what kind of support uh, do we provide to primary care and vice versa? Um, that if we're going to then take responsibility, if we think about folks who are in this quadrant four who have more chronic health conditions as well as more serious behavioral health conditions, we would actually suggest that they should be um, served in a behavioral health setting uh, for both of those conditions, uh, but it means more than you just hire a nurse or you, you, know, you just have people wait, that if you're going to provide primary care, that there are um, lots of other things that come along with that. Um, we have a paper that we published in 2009 that really kind of talks um, more um, in depth on this topic. It's uh, the idea behind it is w what would a medical home or a person-centered healthcare home look like for people with um, serious mental illness. And then in 2010, we did a follow-up paper for people with substance use disorders. Um, and it's just been a question of, you know, where has there been more evidence and more research over the years? And then what we've done then also is really laid out all of the different service components. And I think this is a question that came up last night uh, because, again, I think both policymakers and sometimes practitioners think that all people with mental illness are the same and need the same kind of constellation of services. Um, so what we've tried to do then in those papers is to really break out all of the intensive kind of services that usually go along with more serious mental health or substance use disorders. All right. So then the question becomes, where should care be delivered? And again, there's no magic answer here, right? This are, these are kind of a conceptual framework. What's going to depend on is, you know, what we've learned, um, uh, which you probably experienced, right? All health care is local. Uh, what kind of the situation is in your community around existing relationships, existing capacity, um, who gets along with who, um, uh, how many practitioners of different types are there in your community will determine, you know, kind of how this plays out. Um, but we also know, right, that our system is terribly underfunded. 
um, that we have more demand frequently than we have capacity to serve. Um, so the question also becomes where, you know, are there certain people that can be served in primary care that then take some pressure off of us? If there are people who are only coming in once a year for med checks, do they really need to be on the mental health center um, docket? Or could they be more adequately treated in primary care as long as then there's consultation and the primary care practice knows, you know, if this person begins to have problems, we have an expedited way to get them back into our service. Um, so uh, we, we've, and we've done a number of projects over the years, you know, kind of playing with this. How would this actually look in communities? And the most important step, right, is can we actually get the local behavioral health providers and the FQHCs to actually talking to each other, um, then making decisions about how they're going to identify people who's going to get referred to who. But I remember the first year we did this, we worked with a, um, two organizations in Montana, and the Community Mental Health Center had a waiting list of over 750 people who were waiting for psychiatric appointments. And through the process of this project, it wasn't an explicit goal, but they started looking at who were the clients of the FQHC, who were the clients of the CMHC, and they discovered, much to their surprise, that there was like an 80% overlap in clients, and then they started making, looking at, well, who seems stable? Could we just, could the FQHC actually do the prescribing? And by the end of that year, they were able to get the waiting list down for the psychiatric clinic down to about 10. So we went from 750 to 10, and it was all about them coming together, identifying who were common patients, working out protocols about who was gonna prescribe, and it ended up meeting both of their needs um, in a way that uh, hadn't been apparent to them previously. Um, so this idea of integration does not mean we don't need a specialty system, but it means that our system needs to react differently. It needs to operate um, and respond to primary care a little bit differently. And I think a, a central idea here is this idea of stepped care. And stepped care is, the, is, you know, can we identify and do brief treatment in primary care? And if that works, that's great. And if it doesn't, do we have a, uh, uh, then a process in which people can get into specialty mental health and substance use? Do we have a relate, you know, and what's been interesting as local systems have tried, wrestled with this idea is, you know, we have to trust our primary care colleagues that they actually made a good diagnosis, um, that, you know, we take the information from them and then we use it in a very proactive way. But as a mental health system, all right, so I'm going to talk from mental health system, we're like stuck in our ways, right? Um, so I know a, we're a one project where they're trying to do step care up in Seattle, and uh, they had this idea where primary care was screening for common disorders, they were screening for anxiety and substance use and depression, they were initiating treatment in primary care, and if the person wasn't getting better, they were sending them over to specialty care um, to then take over responsibility and try to ramp up services. Uh, but at the beginning of this project, what was happening is that as people came over, um, they were getting assigned a case manager who then did a new assessment, um, and those people were sitting for weeks and weeks and weeks before they ever saw a psychiatrist. So it's like, you know, this person was engaged in care, was getting some baseline treatment. We sent them over to you in order to give, you, give them more intense services, and what they got was a case manager. You know, most people don't experience that as treatment, right? That, that's a nice thing to have, but it's not treatment. And I think that's also um, part of the, pro I think part of the thing we have to think about is how do we do a better job of getting people into treatment quickly? And most people do not consider assessment and treatment planning um, treatment. It's not treatment. Um, and as organizations, we like to blame a lot of other people, right? Well, the state makes us collect all this information. The county says that we've got to do this. The joint commission, oh my gosh, their requirements are so strenuous. Um, but we've worked with over 500 organizations around the country. And when we sit down with them and we look at all of the requirements, whether they be federal Medicaid requirements, your state requirements, whoever accredits you, what their requirements are for what should be in an assessment, what have we found universally? Almost every single organization is collecting two to three times more information than is required of them. And that takes a lot of time, it's expensive, uh, and then what we do is we have this fun thing where we break down how much it actually cost you to collect all that information versus what you get paid. 
And that's usually the eye opener for people, right? Uh, we worked with one organization in Portland, Oregon. Their intake process was taking four and a half hours, but they needed, they had to have all this information, it was costing them $800, and they were getting reimbursed $130. So uh, they had a huge backup at their front door because their staff were spending so much time doing each of these assessments. They had a huge drop-off rate. Fifty percent of those people who did the assessment never came back for the second appointment. Uh, and they were losing um, $600 uh, on every person who came into care. I know we like this. You know, it's, it's not a good business model. Right? It's not a good way to sustain care into the future. And it's also not responsive to patients and it's not responsive to our partners. Sorry I digressed on that. All right. So um, to talk just a little bit then about how do we improve the care of depression in primary care. And what I want to segue into talking a little bit is this idea of collaborative care. Um, and I think it's the most researched model um, for how our system should work together. It shows great clinical effectiveness as well as cost effectiveness to the system. Much of the research, uh, early research was done on depression, and that's what my slides talk about, but I think Rich Brown is going to talk later. Um, it's the same kind of model, ESPERT and screening and brief intervention for substance use is, a very, is, is basically the same model. A lot of more recent research done around anxiety, other places doing it for bipolar disorder. So don't think of this just as depression. Think about this as a way of um, organizing care. Uh, most research for depression, probably easiest um, to implement for depression, but not, um, not uh, limited there. And the whole idea here is screening is important, but it's not sufficient. So there was a lot of effort early on, right? Could we just screen for more mental health disorders uh, in primary care? Wouldn't that be great? But right, screening is only half of the problem. After people get screened, and they actually have to have treatment. Um, so then the, the next kind of iteration of that was, well, can we do a better job of referring people to specialty care? And what do we find? 50% of people who are referred to specialty care never show up. Part of it is stigma, right? I don't want to go to that mental health place, I don't have that problem. Part of it's just not convenient, uh, part of it's unfamiliar, you know, um, so then the, the question became, all right, well, if the referral process isn't working, what else should we do? Um, and uh, that then led into some of the um, studies around collaborative care. And basically it has a couple of, uh, of key components, um, that there is um, screening that happens in primary care, so this is primary care based, um, that there is a care manager on site who in some places, and everybody kind of implements this differently, sometimes it's that care manager who's actually implementing the screening instruments, sometimes it's the front desk staff, um, but that that care manager is there for two really important reasons. One, to do brief interventions with the people who screen positive. Um, to see, you know, in a couple of sessions, short brief sessions, can they actually help them? Um, and then they also then uh, interact with a consulting psychiatrist. And the idea here is um, that the people uh, might be responding to care or not, and can the psychiatrist help then make recommendations? Now, there's some other really important components to this, which I think we need to think about as a field. One is the systematic use of um, data to guide clinical decision making. Sounds radical, right? So in this, if we're talking about depression, it's things like using the PHQ-9 not just to determine does somebody have depression, but also re-administering that instrument over time to see if their depression is getting better. For substance use disorders, they're you know, using the audit C. Uh, for anxiety, there are you know, instruments. So the idea here is, is the person's depression getting better or not? And then part of what this consultation is between the care manager and the psychiatrist, it's for this group of people who aren't getting better. What do we need to do about them? So it also helps you then focus your resources on the people who aren't getting better. So you're not just giving everything to everybody, but you're focusing then on people who are not having clinical improvement. Now, does that make sense? Wouldn't we want that right? Yeah, I, uh, Jürgen Unitzer, who's a professor at the University of Washington, uh, uh, he, he talks about you know, thinking about this. If you went to your primary care doctor and they said that you had high blood pressure, and they initiated a regimen of medications to help you control your blood pressure, and then the next time you came back to see your physician and she said to you, 
how's that blood pressure doing without taking your blood pressure, without putting a cuff on, you wouldn't really think that that was a good thing, right? Uh, but we, that's what we do all the time for depression and for anxiety and for other things. We say, hey, how's that depression doing? Uh, and the idea here is do we have some kind of um, objective measure that we're using consistently to help us make clinical decisions? Now, I would say, though, that this is not something that only could be used in primary care. If you think about what's the reverse of this, if we're going to be taking on responsibility for screening people's uh, for their primary care needs in specialty care, uh, we're going to be doing the same thing around blood pressure, around lipids, you know, that we need to have comparable kind of processes. Uh, and we have projects going on right now where we're working with behavioral health organizations to implement the PHQ-9. Um, usually the psychiatrists are freaked out. Well, we don't need that. Uh, we know, you know, you know, we've got these great clinical skills. Uh, uh, but, you know, most of the time they've actually find it very, after it gets implemented, after their initial resistance is worn down, uh, they actually find it very helpful. All right, so again, uh, what are the, you know, kind of the core components? One is systematic diagnosis and outcomes tracking. Um, this also then is part of what I was talking about yesterday about health. Why is health IT going to be important? because we need some ability to collect and use this information so that we can identify who's getting better or not. Because we just can't keep it in our heads, right? We need to be able to look at that. So whose PHQ-9 score is not getting better over time? What have we done with them? What, did that work or not? Let's try something else. The same kind of thing, think about it in reverse. If you've got patients who have high blood pressure, what are you doing? How are you tracking that over time? And then following them. So kind of what we need are, is this thing called the clinical registry. Um, and most, unfortunately, most electronic medical records right now don't have this functionality. It's actually an add-on that you have to, uh, you have to purchase. But it's the kind of thing we want um, organizations to be thinking about. How are you um, organizing information over time and targeting your interventions to the people who aren't getting better? And then the other component of this right is the step care. How do we then get people to the right care at the right time? All right. So this is just t talking about, you know, this idea of modifiable risk behaviors. It might seem overwhelming, but these are really important because if we can make slight improvements, if we can get people to reduce smoking or we can get uh, a, a slight increase in exercise, uh, that these things actually have huge payoffs for individuals in terms of improved health care. Um, the organization that I work for, we just published, a, a, we have a, a contract with the SAMHSA to run an integrated care resource center. Uh, its address is www.integration.samhsa.gov. Um, and we just published a paper that kind of looked at what's all the evidence about modifying risk behaviors for people with serious mental illness. What works, what doesn't work, uh, that could be a good resource for you. And it's up on our website. Okay. So I want to uh, just move ahead and think about, you know, this, I know this seems kind of daunting. We already have too many clients. We don't know, you know, we don't have enough money. Um, uh, so the question becomes then, um, you know, how do we implement this in a way that makes sense? How will some of the coverage expansions in the Affordable Care Act help or not? Although I know Wisconsin has already been much more progressive than a lot of other states. Um, but also just think, continue to think about this as what are the opportunities here for us to prove our value to the rest of health care? Um, this is, and it's not just FQHCs, but also, you know, hospitals have new um, performance measures that's going to that's going to influence their Medicare reimbursement. One of those performance measures is are they uh, reducing unnecessary hospitalization post 30 days after discharge? What do we know about that group of people who get readmitted to the hospital uh, 30 days after discharge? High rates of mental health and substance use disorders. Is there something that we can do to help our hospital meet their quality targets? Because those quality targets will then also influence their Medicare reimbursement. The first year, it's 1% up if you, you get a 1% bump if you meet your quality targets and a 1% reduction if you don't. Uh, and then it's going to move to 2% up and 2% down. Think about your bottom line. Would 1% up or down make a difference? Uh, 
most of my experience in most of our organizations, uh, your net margin is usually about 1%, so they actually double your net margin at the end of the year. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to tell your board? Um, you know, so I think hospitals are really concerned about this. You know, this will be um, influenced by what's available in your community. I know part of what we'll do today is talk about, you know, what, what's happening in other parts of Wisconsin and also the ability then to um, think about uh, what options do you have uh, based on your particular needs? Um, but there's going to be, you know, some things that you're going to want to take a, you know, take a look at. What are the, you know, what's existing in our community? Uh, what kind of workforce do we have? What kind of training or um, augmentation might they need? The University of Massachusetts actually has an online course that um, trains behavioral health providers to work in primary care. You know, we, we like, uh, we're used to this idea that everybody gets a 50 minute appointment every week. Uh, primary care doesn't operate that way. Um, so, you know, how do you then adjust to the different kinds of tempo and expectations in primary care? Um, and also, how do we think about Part of this also is thinking about our work as more episodic, um, that we come in to address a particular behavioral, behavioral manifestation that's happening for that patient, we make a difference, and then we move on to the next thing. Um, so there are some training courses available for that, and some of that, it, we also have some tools uh, on the National Council website. You know, reimbursement is going to matter. You know, again, because this is, plays out differently, right now we have at least 50 different Medicaid systems around the country, sometimes more, depend, you know, depending on whether uh, what role the uh, county government has in making Medicaid policy. Um, we have some tools on our website to help you think about what's possible. You want to think about what, what gets reimbursed for whom, when, um, you know, at what level. Um, so you, that also then helps make this decision about what care happens in which setting based on reimbursement. But you do want to think about that. You want to think about what population you're targeting, uh, what's going to make the most sense in your community, uh, and what do people prefer. Now, you know, I think um, we like to think about you need three kind of components for integrated care. You, you, know, you want to start with what's the clinical model. I think that's always the most important thing to think about. What are we trying to do clinically? And then what financial and structural supports do we need um, to support our clinical intervention? Now, unfortunately, what we're seeing around the country is this idea, uh, well, we're just going to move everybody into integrated um, capitated um, managed care um, because we like integration and that will solve all of our problems. Uh, but what we've seen time and time again is if you simply integrate the money but don't actually think about what's happening at the site of care, there's not going to be any improvement. Um, so to the extent that you can, we always like to say start with what you're, start with your model, what are you trying um, to, um, to obtain and then try to think about what kind of structure and financing you're going to need to support that. All right, so that was my 30,000 foot view of integration. I think there's five minutes if people have questions, comments, um, before we move on to the next speaker. You can save them for, you can save them for the... Did the... Do you find in your projects that you've been implementing around the nation that the client is more hesitant to have their home care at behavioral centers versus primary care centers? All right, so, uh, you know, we hear for all kinds of things, right, that there's patient resistance to what we want to do. Our experience is very little about patient resistance. It's usually more that our uh, the staff resistance to change. Uh, and it's, um, I always thought the only useful thing I learned in social work school was the idea that all organisms tend towards homeostasis. Um, it's been the only thing that's kind of played itself out more, you know, kind of consistently throughout my professional life. And I've often thought for a profession that's about helping people change, we sure don't like to change, do we? Um, so I actually, our experience is actually it's more that staff and others uh, resist change. You know, I think consumers, um, you know, they're going to make their own choice about wh what they want to get, you know, where they're going to want to get their care. But if they have a relationship with you, they're used to coming to your organization, and you're now you're offering something else that's going to benefit them. You know, I think that's usually um, accepted. 
you know, the places where um, people have co-located primary care and it's not working, it's actually because the line staff who are interacting with clients are doing a very bad job. They're not bought into it. They don't think it's important. They're doing a bad job of explaining it. They're not you know, encouraging people to do it. Uh, you know, my boss is also a social worker. Um, she, you know, started off as a case aide, you know, did all kinds of jobs, and she said, I could convince my clients to do anything, <laughs> you know, uh, and I think most of us, right, if we have a good therapeutic relationship, we can help people make good decisions. Um, but it's, I think usually the biggest barrier is staff resistance. So I work in a clinic where we do have both mental health and medical, and, um, I think we've done a pretty good job of collaborating, but part of the difficulty is in trying to carve out time to be able to do that collaboration because as with pretty much all healthcare organizations, there's that push for productivity. Um, and so can you say a little bit about how um, other organizations that you have talked with are handling that, balancing that, um, the push for productivity with the need for some time to be able to do that collaboration piece. Well, before you give up the mic, what kind of things have you tried in your organization? What's worked and not worked? Um, email oh. <laughs> and passing paperwork back and forth and um, you know, catching each other in the hallway. And is that, is that working for you? Um, it's hit and miss. I mean, that's part of the problem is that you know, when we need to talk with the physicians, they're not always available. Um, and if they have a full schedule, when they're going to be available, it you know depends on if they have a no-show. Yeah, I wish I had like the, the magic bullet for you. I think what we've seen though is, is organizations trying all kinds of things like that, whether it's text messaging um, or email, you know, in order to you know get real click. Uh, we've had one organization that was using, you know, they were across the street from each other. What they were doing is they had a whole process where they would fax consultations back and forth. I don't think there's a magic bullet. I think it's what's going to work in your environment. Um, you know, do you have time for a quick huddle in the morning? Um, you know, th there are different, you know, kind of things to think about. You know, if you're going to be doing targeted consultation on people who aren't improving, um, so can there be uh, a dedicated time once a week, once a month, where the care manager is talking to whoever the consultant is, whether that's the primary care consultant or a psychiatric consultant? Um, we also have an integration listserv that's open to anybody, then you can post these kinds of questions on our listserv too to get other kinds of examples. I'm getting the high sign. <laughs> All right, well, well there'll be, uh, I'm around and there'll also be a panel today, so we're happy to answer more questions later. Thanks for your time and uh, look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Chuck.